Okay. We are looking at today the origins of the American government, particularly the colonies uh, and their philosophy, their thinking, and, uh, and how America developed into a system uh, that prioritized local self-government quite a bit and kind of that Western tradition that developed in Europe uh, and spread to the United States. Also the, the colonial system uh, being one that basically necessitated self-government since Britain sent over people from the colonies. They formed local bodies and even though they were under the, the technical jurisdiction of the king and of, of Britain, they were thousands of miles away. So they had to form uh, local uh, assemblies and laws and, and things to uh, govern themselves in many cases, which eventually comes to a head of conflict when that local self-government uh, that had been maintained for a long time uh, is threatened by the overreach of the British government, at least as it's interpreted in the United in uh, the American colonies. And so that's where the clash of the American Revolution sort of comes from. <clears throat> but really we have to look at the, the Western and the Christian tradition to understand a lot of this, this thought. Uh, really, Augustine or Augustine, depending on uh, how you want to pronounce that, is one of the main formulators of this kind of Western Christian thinking with regard to government. Of course, the, the Bible, the Christian scriptures would be as well. But they basically came to formulate a philosophy of government that necessitated limited government because their thinking was if only God had ultimate power and authority and only God may rightly possess absolute power, that though God ordains governments, that they are inherently limited, just like all human power is inherently limited. This is a production of uh, Christian thinking, not just Western uh, non-Christian enlightenment thinking. Uh, one author writing about Augustine and the influence of Christian thinking says the limited state is a creation of Christian thinking, particularly of Augustine. It arose from the fundamental experience of the incarnation, that is the uh, belief of Christ coming in human flesh, uh, the appearance of God in human form at a definite place and time in human history. Christian thinking about politics was based on a new discovery about the destiny of man. Man lived in order to attain fellowship with God. Now, whether or not you believe that or you're a Christian, uh, you need to understand the, the background of the thinking and the philosophy that influences the modern American thought and tradition, and that comes from the thinking of the Christian tradition. And so it can basically be summed up in uh, several thoughts. One is that rulers are not divine. Now, it was common through much of human history to think of rulers as divine beings, as gods, uh, as the representation of God himself or multiple gods on the earth. Think of Pharaoh, think of Caesar, uh, think of uh, the emperor of Japan, that the, the emperor, the kings, the queens, the rulers, the potentates were seen as being gods. Um, Christianity and Judaism being monotheistic and worshiping uh, the God of the uh, scriptures rejected this uh, and posited that rulers are not divine. They, they may possess a certain uh, mandate or a divine authority in a limited sense, but they themselves are not divine. This was a product of Christian thinking. Number two, this also developed the idea that private property is to be protected, that if governments are subject to the rules and laws of, of everyone else, of the laws of God, the laws of nature, uh, that if that is part of your, your thinking, your philosophy, the, the presuppositions you bring in, then 
that means that commandments like the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal, uh, apply as much to those in governmental power and authority as they do to anyone else. Same with thou shalt not murder and thou shalt not covet and all those aspects of uh, limitation on individual human behavior uh, ought also be to be applied to government. This is how uh, Judaistic and Christian thinking began to, to formulate with regard to government that uh, inherently limited the power. Uh, social relationships are to be based on legally binding contracts or covenants. Uh, this can include things that are more in the covenantal area in Christian thinking like marriage, but also business relationships are, are contracts that should be honored according to the law and should be enforced according to one's word uh, and that they should uh, be binding uh, and that they should be voluntary and that you should be held to uh, the contracts that you make. Uh, power, fourthly, in human hands must be limited. So humans having power over humans is the situation we are faced with in government. And that's a very precarious situation. So therefore, humans uh, having power over humans and the risk that it carries uh, necessitates limitation of governmental power, according to Christian thought. Now, the fall of the Roman Empire in 476 AD, fast forwarding, also uh, helped solidify this idea of more local self-government, smaller self-government in the West and in the, especially the Christian West, uh, because the Roman Empire disintegrated uh, for, for many reasons. There's, there's a whole history from uh, the historian Edward Gibbon. It's a multi-volume series on the, uh, the rise and fall rise and decline of the Roman Empire, something like that, Edward Gibbon, the historian. But there is overspreading through militarization, there's overspreading through uh, the taxation burden that uh, the elites were not willing to continue, there's the outside attack from the barbarians, uh, there's all sorts of things that causes Rome to fall and there's no interest really in rebuilding the Roman Empire to uh, what it once was. Now, just because the Roman Empire, uh, as it was, ceased to exist, all the tribute paying areas that were paying taxes to the Roman Empire uh, were still power centers, still authority centers. And so it, Europe splintered into what we would kind of see as moving toward that, that modern Europe. Now, it's not forming yet uh, modern European states, which doesn't happen until uh, really until the Middle Ages. Uh, and after the Middle Ages with the, the treaties of Westphalia, where we start to get more of the, the idea of a modern nation state as we think of it today. But this is more the idea of uh, feudalistic European medieval kingdoms um, and principalities. They're, they're various areas of territory and authority um, over which kings and rulers fought uh, to gain uh, land and territorial disputes, but, but were fairly limited in their scope uh, and in their jurisdiction and power. Um, Ralph Rake, a historian, writes, instead of experiencing hegemony of a universal uh, empire, Europe evolved into a mosaic of kingdoms, principalities, city-states, ecclesiastical domains, and other entities. And so what he's saying there is instead of having that one centralized authority with the Roman Empire, which the Roman Empire, though it was receiving taxes, did allow for a lot of um, local independence anyway. Um, instead of having that one center of authority in the Roman Empire, everything broke up into multiple kingdoms all across of what we know as modern Europe. Some ruled by the church, some bound together by the Roman Catholic Church, some uh, with their local princes, local rulers, warlords, kings, princes, governors, all sorts of things that uh, that were unique to their own culture, tradition, religion, local area, 
that type of thing. So this is where the, the tradition that's going to influence and bleed over into the American tradition is going to begin of this, this local self-government limitation of centralized power. Uh, the system guided the development of liberty. Now, it may not be liberty as we think of it today, but it started to limit inherently the power of local rulers, uh, because instead of being in one centralized system of the Roman Empire, there were now options for the people to leave if the, the laws, the taxation uh, became a tyranny, and so they could reject the uh, the local rule there, and uh, this causes further limitation of power. Uh, the rise of freedom occurred not as a result of positive action of governments, but precisely because of the absence of a strong central authority in Europe. Following the dissolution of the Roman Empire, no continent-wide empire took its place. So there's no replacement empire. It was the breakup of the Roman Empire that actually started the movement toward modern, uh, what we think of as, uh, as liberalism or, or more of a liberty-based um, system. So it wasn't that governments facilitated and created this. It was actually absence of one government, the several governments and the spreading out of power allowed for this. Uh, the decentralized uh, nature of Europe gave rise to more political freedom. Now, most people... Hello. Myself over here. Uh, so political freedom started to be the result. Now, it's not political freedom as we may think of in more of like a modern liberal democracy in the 21st century, but it was started to move in that direction. Um, people have a kind of misconception about the Middle Ages. Um, and though it's not a time that I would like to live just because of uh, the material well-being of the present time, um, it, it did start to move and have aspects of it uh, that were, were very developed in the sense of uh, systems of thought, tradition, um, religion, all sorts of things uh, that there's some of the, the greatest thinkers are produced during this time. So it's not it's not uh, the kind of negative aspects uh, that a lot of people try to portray it as, uh, at least in that that caricatured type of way. But anyway, multiple jurisdictions meant that the government Rulers risked losing populations if they tax excessively. So in other words, if the rulers were taxing too much, people could move a lot more easily in this mosaic of kingdoms than they could under a single empire uh, nationwide. And so this uh, limited the ability of rulers to continue to tax against uh, the will of the local rulers, the lords, the people. Uh, people now had the option to vote with their feet. Uh, this liberty limited government power to tax and made governments more competitive. So governments actually had to compete. And we see that today, even within the United States, uh, governments compete with each other within the 50 states and people have the option to vote with their feet and move to other states for what they see to be more favorable conditions. This is called the demonstration effect. Uh, Ralph Rako again writes, uh, the demonstration effect that has become a constant element in European progress uh, and which could exist precisely because Europe was a decentralized system of competing jurisdictions helped spread the liberal politics that brought prosperity to the towns that first ventured to experiment with them. So as people loosened up uh, power and authority um, and and recognize that this benefited them uh, economically. Uh, people began to experiment with this more and the more decentralized the system was, uh, the more there was opportunity for this progress to occur. And as it was more successful, uh, it invited others to follow its example. Uh, during the Middle Ages, during that thousand year period, about 400 to 1400, uh, there was a really a there were kingdoms all over, but there was really a lack of a unitary sovereign government that had absolute authority 
over the people. There was a multiplicity of authorities. Uh, one uh, historian writes, there were liberties of the church based on law superiority, superior to that of the king. So there's competing authorities between the government uh, and the church, which were tugging at authority and the church, the Roman Catholic church at the time, something of a government itself. It says, there was the law of nature graven in the hearts of men and not to be erased by royal writs, meaning there were certain laws of um, just humanity that were uh, not to just be expunged, couldn't just be uh, erased by the decree of the king. It says, and there were the prescription, there was the prescription of the immemorial local and feudal custom, meaning most areas followed custom, they followed local laws that existed uh, in, in their thinking forever. And so those were not to be altered and changed. The laws which ruled men's lives were the customs of their trade, locality, or estate, not the positive law of a legislator. So it's actually a pretty decentralized system of laws at this time, not a lot of new laws being produced. As it's more about your local area, your trade, your estate, your customs, your traditions decide uh, more so than the positive laws of a government creating, legislating, and enforcing laws onto people. Um, so it's a fairly decentralized system. And the whole sum of English parliamentary, parliamentary legislation for the whole Middle Ages is less uh, in bulk than that of the single reign of Henry VIII. So Henry VIII begins to reign and produces in his reign, which becomes a lot more centralized over kind of an English empire, he produces more laws during his reign than the whole thousand year period of the Middle Ages produced in that decentralized system. So there's very little in the way of law or regulation. This didn't mean laws didn't exist. It just meant that it was very localized uh, and on a small scale. On the, mid, uh, the medieval political society has been uh, called one of the most loosely organized societies in history. Uh, those who wanted to centralize government found themselves at odds with historical liberties of towns, guilds, universities, and the church. So if you wanted to make new laws, you were pretty much competing against these systems and traditions that ex it existed, that people had uh, cultural uh, affinity with. So creating a bunch of new laws at odds with these would not have uh, been a workable system. The king did not make law, but was bound by the law. This was the system of uh, feudal Europe. The Roman Catholic Church also played uh, largely into this factor um, and was a competing authority to uh, the, the kings and the, the civil government. The feudal system, uh, feudalism developed in Christian nations. I use that term loosely in more of the political sense. Uh, but feudalism was the idea of being based on a covenant or contract. It laid the foundation uh, for modern contractual obligations. The contracts and covenants of feudalism involve God as a third party. So now when we think of contract, we think just person to person maybe with government as a third party or an enforcer. But these uh, covenants thought of uh, this relationship of contract as person to person with God as the third party and enforcer. So there was a, a enforcement level uh, that was recognized as a higher authority. Uh, taxes in feudal contracts could not be altered. So if the king altered a feudal contract or a covenant, uh, that would be seen as breaking the law of God and therefore uh, unenforceable, not to be obeyed, and that the king would actually uh, be under the punishment of God for breaking that covenant because they'd be an unfaithful to God. Now, this comes up during the uh, American Revolution, the Presbyterians especially, and the Christians uh, in America and in England for in large part, see the king as being disobedient to the promise he made to them and their forefathers before God not to raise the taxes beyond a customary amount and 
to protect them from having that done to them by parliament. So they actually accused King George III later on in, in the American colonies of sin for breaking his covenant as king not to change the tax code. And so they see this as unenforceable and unconstitutional. So it's actually a constitutional crisis that drives the American Revolution. It's not the amount of taxation. Uh, one of the statements uh, from this time uh, that was said by one of the popes, Pope St. Gregory I, uh, around 600 AD, said, God will surely punish anyone who reinstitutes an old tax, meaning that there was the... Uh, disapprobation of God, the religious elite, and the Christian society for someone to come in politically and try to change the tax code. Uh, the King of Tours, uh, as an example, as a European king during this time, promised he would not burden the people with new taxes, but without his even his knowledge, a count in his kingdom decided to create a new tax. And since the king feared the punishment of God, he destroyed the new tax, got rid of it, personally paid the money back and confessed his sin to God. Now, this you may not believe the same way the king of Tours did, but you can see the influence of Christianity on this system to limit even taxing power and authority in the case of the king of Tours. Uh, King John, as portrayed here in the Disney movie, uh, Robin Hood, as he's collecting uh, taxes beyond the customary amount. Um, and, and his brother, Richard, who's portrayed in the movie as the good guy, but Richard is really uh, facilitating and pursuing the Crusades, uh, which are creating a larger need for, for taxation uh, through the churches, especially. And so John and Richard kind of are these dual monarchs that... Uh, increase war, government power, and taxation in Europe. Uh, John is eventually forced by these uh, feudal lords to sign the Magna Carta. Uh, this began the process of modern politics. Kings had to bargain with the local lords uh, for tax money in exchange for liberties and rights. So now, in order to grant the king tax money for these lords to tax the people, they had to uh, the king had to grant certain privileges. And so after the Magna Carta, English government was based on the separation of powers. There was a competing power between the parliament that could write the laws and could raise tax revenue and the king who could enforce the laws but could not raise tax revenue. So in short, the king could spend but not tax. Parliament could tax but not spend. And so this was a limitation of uh power and a separation of powers that further uh, limited government's ability to uh, over awe, overpower the people. Holland became an example of this as well. It became uh, relatively free and liberal, it became the foundation, uh, along with England in many ways, of the uh, process that developed uh, into our modern economies and to the material wealth that pretty much exploded from the late 1700s moving forward. Um, historian Ralph Reiko writes about this, owing, to, uh, owing its independence to the decentralized state system of Europe, it emerged itself as a decentralized polity without a king and court. Now, Holland is operating as a system without a king, without a court. It says it was a headless commonwealth that combined secure property rights, religious toleration, and intellectual freedom with a degree of prosperity that amounted to an early modern economic miracle. That's a Dutch word, worst uh, craft wonder, uh, economic miracle. Now, Holland, because it had this decentralized system, because it enforced property rights, had a relatively uh, religious toleration, uh, though it was very Protestant, very Calvinist, uh, intellectual freedom uh, and the ability and social honor of occupations that had not previously been honored, um, social mobility. This created great economic uh, 
prosperity and would continue to create economic prosperity among the Dutch. The English would also follow this tradition and it would be brought to the United States. Um, now in Massachusetts, as the Puritans uh, and others start to come and form colonies, the Puritans in the northern east uh, region of the United States, uh, let me read an act of the Massachusetts General Court from this time. It says, whereas particular towns have many things which concern only themselves, it is therefore ordered that the freemen of every town uh, and or of the major part of them shall have only power to dispose their own lands and woods with all the privileges uh, and appurtenances of said towns to grant lots and make such orders as may concern the well-ordering of their own towns to levy and distrain, also to choose their own particular officers, constables, and surveyors of highways and the like. Now, basically it's saying this, that the only laws and taxes that can be made over towns can be made by the towns themselves because of their own particular uh, local situation. And so this decentralization among the American colonies um, factors heavily into the American uh, tradition of suspicion of large centralized government, uh, the tradition of decentralization, the tradition of uh, states and local rights, uh, the tradition of local self-government, and many other factors as well. Uh, local governments for local areas decide on political issues. This is uh, what develops mainly in the American tradition because of what was carried over from Europe and just the historical situation of the colonies uh, having to govern themselves because of centralized authorities thousands of miles away uh, across a vast Atlantic Ocean. Um, F.A. Hayek in his Road to Serfdom writes uh, of society, uh, his thoughts, his philosophy, whether you agree with them or not, I think it's a interesting statement with regard to this this aspect that we've been talking about today of local self-government he says we shall not rebuild civilization on the large scale it is no accident that on the whole there was more beauty and decency to be found in the life of the small peoples and that among large the large ones there were more happiness and content in proportion as they had avoided the deadly blight of centralization. Nowhere has democracy ever worked without a great measure of local self-government, where the scope of political measures becomes so large that the necessary knowledge is most exclusively possessed by the bureaucracy, the creative impulses of the private person must lag. I believe that here, the experience of the small countries like Holland and Switzerland contains much from which even the most fortunate larger countries like Great Britain can learn. We shall uh, all be gainers if we can create a world for small states to live in. And so what Hayek is arguing there, with, with whether you agree with his philosophy and his thoughts and his analysis uh, or not, is that democracy um, involves a very high level of trust involves a very high level of self-knowledge and knowledge of particular aspects of an ever-changing uh, local situation. The democracy involves uh, knowing the people with whom you're voting and being able to discuss with them uh, and, and to make laws that, that make sense for uh, your local area and also involves uh, entrusting people with the ability to govern themselves. That self-government is ultimately the first and uh, most important type of government is that people must govern themselves effectively. Um, and so he's arguing that democracies uh, are not really workable on the large scale. That democracy only works long-term uh, or republics only work long-term on the small scale. Of, uh, of local self-government where people decide in a community that's small uh, their own local interests and it's easier to determine uh, and get unity than it is on the size of the United States, which has 315 million 
million people, the state of California, which has several million people. Uh, so he's arguing for a very, he's not arguing against government. He's arguing for more governments. He's arguing for lots of small governments um, all over the globe coming down even to self government. And so this is where this tradition comes from in a, in a limited way. We can't talk about everything, but in a limited way, this is where the tradition of self-government really develops uh, into uh, American thought in the modern United States. And much of this is still there. The most uh, impactful uh, actions you can have are within your own local government, though most people pay uh, attention to, to national government, national politics, uh, Local politics are where affect you the most and where you can have the most impact. And that has been known uh, throughout the history of America uh, and is, is still true today. Uh, and so there is, is some argument for the idea of uh, the necessity of governing uh, democratically and, and based on rule of law from a small and local level first uh, rather than trying to work things from a top-down system, starting in Washington, D.C., and trying to allow that to pervade uh, the whole United States. So those are some, uh, some thoughts and a little bit of the background history of America uh, as we continue this course in American history and government.